Mark 13 seems like the most random chapter in the gospel of Mark. Like here we are minding our own business, reading along, following the narrative. Um, yes, he has some somewhat bizarre parables, but that we've come to know and, and assume about Jesus. Um, but then we have this, which is just um, uh, more than, than um, <laughs> more than many of us feel like we can handle. And it comes at the end of a very busy day. Um, Jesus has had another very busy day. His first very busy day we found in Mark chapter one, verses 21 to 34. He was in the synagogue. Um, he was uh, demonstrating his authority. He was teaching. He was casting out unclean spirits. This is chapter one, so he's very new. We don't have, remember in, in Mark, we don't have a big expectation of his arrival. We don't have a big birth account. We don't have, uh, he just sort of shows up on the scene. He heals Simon Peter's mother-in-law. And then after sundown, um, he continues to heal the sick and cast out demons. Well, his very busy day number two comes um, here in Mark chapter 11, verse 20 through 1337. Um, it's all the same day as far as we can see. Uh, the first is the recognition the next morning after he cursed the fig tree that the fig tree has withered. The second is the Jewish leaders questioning Jesus's authority. This is just a quick overview of where we've been the last couple of weeks. The third is the parable of the tenants. Uh, the fourth is Jesus questioned with regard to paying taxes to Caesar, with regard to this, the resurrection and that story of, of the woman who married seven brothers and whose wife will she be in heaven. Um, the story of the, or the conversation about the greatest commandment, um, whose son is the Christ. Remember, uh, right before all of this entry into Jerusalem happened, the, the blind man declares him to be the son of David. Um, then we are, we get this warning about the scribes. Um, we also get the widow's offering and we have now this Olivet discourse. So Jesus on the Mount of Olives having this conversation. So, um, when we look at the arc of this narrative and all that has happened, Jesus has not had this busy of a day, uh, since the first chapter where he comes on the scene. So I want to read through the text together so that we can put it in front of us, especially for those of us who haven't had a chance to read through it yet. Um, and we will uh, then circle back around and look specifically at, at the text as we go. So Mark 13, 1 through 8, as Jesus walked away from the temple, one of his disciples said, teacher, look at that stonework, those buildings. And Jesus said, you're impressed by this grandiose architecture. There's not a stone in the whole works that is not going to end up in a heap of rubble. Later, as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives in full view of the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew got, off, got him off by himself and asked, tell us, when is this going to happen? What sign will we get that things are coming to a head? Jesus began, watch out for doomsday deceivers. Many leaders are going to show up with forged identities, claiming I'm the one. They will keep, they will deceive a lot of people. And when you hear of wars and rumored wars, keep your head and don't panic. This is routine history and no sign of the end. Nation will fight nation and ruler will fight ruler over and over. Earthquakes will occur in various places. There will be famines, but these things are nothing compared to what is coming. And watch out. They're going to drag you into court and then it will go from bad to worse. Dog eat dog, everyone at your throat, because you carry my name. You're placed there as sentinels to the truth. The message has to be preached all across the world. And when they bring you betrayed into court, don't worry about what you'll say. When the time comes, say what is on your heart. The Holy Spirit will make his witness in and through you. It's going to be brother killing brother, father killing child, children killing parents. There's no telling who will hate you because of me. 
Stay with it. That's what's required. Stay with it to the end. You won't be sorry. You'll be saved. But be ready to run for it when you see the monster of desecration set up where it should never be. You who can read, make sure you understand what I'm talking about. If you're living in Judea at the time, run for the hills. If you're working in the yard, don't go back to the house to get anything. If you're out in the field, don't go back to get your coat. Pregnant and nursing mothers will have it especially hard. Hope and pray this won't happen in the middle of winter. These are going to be hard days. Nothing like it from the time God made the world right up to the present. And there'll be nothing like it again. If he let the days of trouble run their course, nobody would make it. But because of God's chosen people, those he personally chose, he has already intervened. If anyone tries to flag you down, calling out, here's the Messiah, or points, there he is, don't fall for it. Fake messiahs and lying preachers are going to pop up everywhere. Their impressive credentials and bewitching performances will pull the wool over the eyes of even those who ought to know better. So watch out. I've given you fair warning. Following those hard times, sun will fade out, moon will cloud over, stars fall out of the sky, cosmic powers tremble. And then they'll see the Son of Man enter in grand style, his arrival filling the sky. No one will miss it. He'll dispatch the angels, and they'll pull in the chosen from the four winds from pole to pole. Take a lesson from the fig tree. From the moment you notice its buds form, the merest hint of green, you know summer's just around the corner. And so it is with you. When you see all these things, you know he's at the door. Don't take this lightly. I'm not just saying this for some future generation, but for this one too. These things will happen. Sky and earth will wear out. My words won't wear out. But the exact day and hour, no one knows that. Not even heaven's angels. Not even the son. Only the father. So keep a sharp lookout, for you don't know the timetable. It's like a man who takes a trip, leaving home and putting his servants in, char in charge, each assigned a task, and commanding the gatekeeper to stand watch. So stay at your post, watching. You have no idea when the homeowner is returning, whether evening, midnight, cock crow, or morning. You don't want him showing up unannounced, with you asleep on the job. I say it to you. And I'm saying it to all, stay at your post, keep watch. All right, so that put the text in front of us from the message. That's Eugene Peterson's translation. Um, in case anybody ever questions that translation for you, let me say a couple of things about it. Uh, one is that he is an incredible Greek and Hebrew scholar. So his translation um, is directly from the from the from the original languages in which the scripture was given to us unlike for example the living bible which is a transliteration um, of sorts it takes the new king james or it takes the king james and puts it into modern language um, so it's not looking at words and considering their intent it's just using the language of the king james and then putting it into something more modern um, the message does have an agenda. We've talked about this before when we talk about scripture um, and the various translations. The agenda of the message is to use language that is accessible because so much of scripture feels inaccessible or inaccessible at times. Um, the purpose of, of Eugene Peterson's translation of the message is to make the language accessible. But we have such strong feelings about language around scripture, don't we? And especially if we've memorized passages um, from a particular translation, we find ourselves sort of migrating back to probably the, the passage that reminds you most of your early life in Christianity, whether it's your childhood or whether it's uh, when you first became a believer. 
I will just say um, when, that when we're studying scripture, like now here in Lent, when we're using the Lenten study guide to walk us through these six weeks of Lent, and we're reading the same passage of scripture every day, one of the things that I mentioned in the study guide is to encourage you to read it in a different translation every day as a way of, of inviting yourself deeper and deeper into an understanding of the text. So uh, moving along, uh, we're going to now change to the English Standard Version for our study this morning. So as Jesus came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be one, there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Well, what you see here in the picture is um, according to uh, both historic documents as well as archaeological evidence, as well as what we have in scripture, an, Im an image of what Solomon's temple might have looked like. And I want you to think about where um, most of our disciples are coming from. Most of them are coming from Galilee. Most of the houses that they live in have been built by stones that they've um, pulled out of the sea that are usually about this big. And we see that um, in the in the ruins in, in Capernaum, that they're all built with these dark black stones that they've gotten out of the sea. Um, so for any of Jesus's disciples who have never been to Jerusalem before, uh, this is this is magnificent. This is one of those places where we have to remind ourselves, of course, we know everything that I'm about to say, but it helps to remind ourselves there were no pictures, there's no camera, um, there, there was no rendering necessarily unless someone had done a drawing of what the temple looked like in Jerusalem. Um, though it was just a couple days journey to walk from Galilee to Jerusalem, that doesn't mean that everybody has done it. Um, and also, this is still under construction. It, the rebuilding of the temple had not yet been complete at the time that Jesus was there. And so this you can kind of see it. It's just an opportunity for them to come to the holy city, to come to the temple. It's the thing that's sort of held up there for us. And um, and just to marvel at, at how amazing it is that, that a, a structure this large would be built. And, um, and Jesus says, yeah, it's going to fall down. <laughs> you just sort of what a like gut blow that is you know that to think that um that something so magnificent um is is gonna fall down like how do you even begin to get your mind around that right well i wanted to give you just a, a couple of pictures that i took uh, about this time last year um i, I think i'm i think i'm uh zoomed in on my not brand new iPhone. So it's a little fuzzy, but this is one of the, one of the gates into the walled city of Jerusalem. I've got another one for you in, in a couple of slides. Um, this one it happens to be the golden gate and it is the gate that, um, the, that tradition holds the Messiah will return through. And the interesting thing about it, as you can see, is that it's not a gate at all. It's um, completely bricked over. Uh, the reason being is that you are looking into the Muslim quarter um, and that very famous dome of the rock you'll see in the next slide, that gold dome is, is part of um, the Muslim complex on top of the Mount of Olives, or sorry, not on top of the Mount of Olives in the in the city of Jerusalem, but we're looking from the Mount of Olives. So I wanted to give you the view that Jesus would have had with his disciples as they're looking from the Mount of Olives into the holy city of Jerusalem. Um, of course, not all of this type of houses would be there. Um, but here's another view of it. This is one of those panorama pictures. I got somebody's arm in it. Um, it's actually the, the bottom half of the Mount of Olives is a graveyard. Um, and so you're seeing graves in front of me. Um, Schindler, you remember from Schindler's list, uh, he's buried in this in this graveyard. But you look down over the graveyard through the Kidron Valley where those um, trees are down in the in the sort of valley there. And then you come back up and you can see the dome, see the gold dome of the rock. 
just in front of that, then you can see the wall of the of the city. And um, that gold dome now sits where the Temple of Solomon would have been. So this is very likely the view that Jesus and his disciples had because I'm standing on the Mount of Olives taking this picture. And, and of course, it wouldn't be as populated with as many buildings, but certainly Solomon's temple was something to behold that um, that stood up. This is um, the, this has, uh, most of the gates have a couple different names, but this is um, the Lion's Gate. See the, see to the right and to the left of the, of this part of the, the gate there's there's like lions that are looking at each other so that's so it's called the lion's gate um there are you can get a small car there through there but generally people just walk through this gate except um like cars that are dropping off supplies for some of the um shops that are inside the old city um, so just want to give you a, a chance to see that. Now, um, without you having to do anything, Lisa is going to shoot you into um, breakout rooms uh, for four minutes. And in four minutes, I'd like each of you, both of you, so you're just going to be two by two in a room, just you and somebody else. Um, and I'd like you to answer this question. In the parable, I stole this from Mary Beth. In the parable, the man going on a journey puts his servants in charge, each with his work or task. What has Christ put you in charge of? What do you feel like Christ has put you in charge of? And how are you doing? And will you be delighted to see Christ when he returns? Or are you struggling to stay awake? Are you struggling to stay focused? See if you can kind of get your mind around this question. Yes. <laughs> All right, so we're going to move on. Um, uh, so <laughs> I, I'm just trying to mix it up for us a little bit and, and have this uh, be a good and rich experience for you. And my having attended the seminar that I attended for three days last week uh, just gave me some new tools. So I won't try them all on you in one week, but that was a great way for me in a class of 58 people who I did not know any of them to have a couple of those one-on-ones was, was just a a nice way. It's also a way to stay engaged with the material uh, when you know that you're going to um, have a one-on-one -on -one with somebody. So, all right. So we've got Jesus. He's sitting on the Mount of Olives. The disciples marvel at, at the at the size of the temple. And he says, yeah, it's not going to stay that way. Um, what you're seeing in the picture here are is the Church of All Nations, um, and then there's a Russian church that you can see the onion domes of the Russian Orthodox Church. This is actually, uh, both of these are on the Mount of Olives. Um, so we're no longer looking into the city. We're looking from the city up to the Mount of Olives just, um, just to, you know, plant that seed for you guys to all say as soon as the pandemic is over, let's go to the Holy Land and I'll say, yes, let's do it. All right. So now let's get back to Mark 13, three through eight. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when will these things be? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? Now, I want you to notice something that maybe you didn't notice the first time that we read it. And that is the full assumption on the part of Peter, James, John, and Andrew, that what he is saying is true. That's, you can see in the nature of their question that they've come to a place of believing what he's telling them. Peter's not rebuking him. They're not denying him, though they're sitting across the valley from this splendid temple, the, the, the rocks of which, you know, the, it's made out of these big stones that are broader than my arm span. Um, they're not questioning the, the veracity of what Jesus is saying. They're not, they're not poo-pooing it. They're, they're not looking at him funny, they just want to know when it's going to happen so that they can 
can be prepared. And I don't want us to miss how important that shift is. We are seeing a shift starting to take place in Jesus's interaction with his disciples, where they are not among those questioning his authority. They are not among those wondering about what he is saying. Instead, they're just like, all right, if you've got that much information, how much more information can you give us so that we can be well prepared for this? So verse five, Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places, and there will be famines. And these are but the beginning of the birth pains. So let's put this a little bit into some perspective for ourselves here. When Jesus is saying these things, wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, I think that what he's saying is, look, all of the things that have happened throughout history, they're going to keep happening. Now that you have the knowledge that that there will be a great destruction, don't assume that everything that you hear is is the the precursor of this great destruction. In other words, when you hear that a war is happening over here, don't assume that you're going to end up in that war and it's going to be the great war that ends all things. When you hear of an earthquake that happens over there, don't assume that the next earthquake is going to happen here. In other words, we need to figure out how to be discerning about when things are really starting to snowball and when things are just following the course of of history and the course of history involves wars it involves earthquakes and it involves people leading other people astray now in 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 a politically correct world i'm not supposed to say what i'm about to say but almost say it anyway <laughs> um i think that one of those great misleadings that one of those great false teachers is Muhammad. 600 years after the death of Christ, Muhammad ends up on the scene critiquing the scriptures of the Old and New Testaments, saying, I am of the line of Abraham, but I am of the right line of Abraham. You all from the very beginning have misinterpreted this. You thought it was Isaac who would fulfill the promise, but the first son of Abraham is actually Ishmael. So let me now explain to you how all of this takes place. And not only that, but um, after conquering, and it is, a, it is absolutely a religion that was established through conquering, after conquering Mecca and conquering Medina, the, um, the Muslims, the followers of Muhammad came and conquered Jerusalem as well, and built on the sacred site of both the Jewish and Christian traditions, this dome of the rock that we saw in the previous picture, and it has been there since, claiming that space as their own. The temple is built on Mount Moriah, which is the site of Abraham's offering of Isaac uh, in obedience to God, where God then supplied the ram in, in Isaac's stead. And so we can see what, how dangerous it is to have a false Messiah lead us astray. Islam is one of the fastest growing religions in the world. And we, we see, while it may nod to Jesus as a prophet, it condemns Christianity um, as infidels. And and these are the kinds of things that when we're, when we're looking too hard for something, we can end up following the wrong thing. Did, uh, did anybody ever have their parents tell you you were looking for trouble? 
or maybe you've said it to your own kids, but I certainly remember uh, enough times in my childhood of my parents tell me, telling me that I was looking for trouble. Um, and usually that had to do with complaining about something that my brothers had done. <laughs> so I wasn't out in the world complaining or looking for trouble. It was just getting my brothers in trouble for things that they had done. And that warning that my parents gave to me of, you know, don't look for trouble. There's going to be enough trouble in life. Don't, don't generate it where it doesn't need to be generated. Jesus is giving a similar warning here. So as we continue on verses 9 to 13, he does give us some words of preparation, but be on your guard for they will deliver you over to councils and you will be beaten in synagogues and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them. And the gospel must be, must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who will speak, but the Holy Spirit. Let me stop there before we get to that very troublesome verse 12 and, and, and point out a couple of things here. So this chapter in the Gospel of Mark is um, part of a, of a category of passages within both the Old Testament and the New Testament that are referred to as apocalyptic, um, apocalyptic being end times. And, and, and there are scholars who have sort of taken all of these kinds of passages together, and they have done everything from predict when and how the end will come to... Um, to what we should do about it. Well, I want you to hold on to that when and how the end will come because we're going to get to a response to that in just a second. But it's no news to any of us that that there are those who um, who use scripture um, rather than it in its entirety in its in its peculiarity as well as particularity um, to kind of set out on a theology that doesn't necessarily reflect what Jesus is trying to do here. Um, there's a couple things that are happening here. The temple's going to be destroyed. Well, yeah, I mean, that's true. It happens just 40 years later in 70 AD. But we also know that um, that in the other gospels, when Jesus says this temple will be destroyed and three days later, it'll be rebuilt, that he's talking about his own body. If he is the word made flesh, then, um, then he is also the temple of the spirit, because the purpose of the temple is to give God a place to dwell on earth. If God is already on earth in the incarnation of Jesus, then, then the body of Jesus itself is a temple. So we have going on here that kind of wordplay that is both the physical temple that has been rebuilt after its first destruction that, you know, continues to be referred to as Solomon's temple. That building is going to be destroyed, but also the actual temple of God uh, incarnate in Jesus, that's also going to be destroyed. One of them is going to be rebuilt in three days. The other one has yet to be rebuilt. I also want to point out to you uh, verse 10. The gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. Now, I don't think that any of us necessarily disagree with this statement. And I think it's a statement that's very relevant to the, you know, year 30, whatever we're in with Jesus, um, and the, the need for the gospel to go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth, which is what we get in the first chapter of, of the book of Acts. And we see the faithfulness of Jesus's disciples. 
disciples in spreading the gospel to the ends of the earth so that all nations um, can hear the good news. Remember the word gospel means good news. Um, we also use the word gospel to refer to the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Now, there are, there are wonderful organizations, uh, one of which Cindy McNabb is very familiar with, Wyc Wycliffe Bible Translators, who um, don't proof text this, but certainly stand on Mark 13, 10 um, as the call to go to the ends of the earth and translate scripture into the languages of all whom we encounter so that every person has the capacity, the opportunity to hear the gospel proclaimed in their own language. Um, let's see. Now we've got verse 12. We've got to hang out with verse 12. Um, D. Standard seems to have left her screen, but her cat is still there. Uh, floating on that red sunset. <laughs> um, Dee, I don't know if you registered your cat for Bible study or not, but we do try to make sure that everyone who attends is registered, so we have email addresses for them. Verse 12, brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Well, this shouldn't surprise us. We know that the persecuted church is alive and well across the globe. So this is not, this is not something that isn't already happening. This is how big of a stumbling block the gospel is to people who are in power and don't want to let go of their power. Notice in verse 9, when he talks about being beaten in synagogues, standing before governors and kings for his sake and bearing witness before them, we're talking about a power dynamic that is happening as a result of the, uh, of the gospel being proclaimed. We're talking about the fact that Jesus's um, the foundations of the kingdom that Jesus is ushering in um, is a kingdom that looks so profoundly different from the kingdoms of this world that it will serve to threaten anyone who's wanting to hold on to their position of power. And we have sadly seen over the course of history that um, people wanting to hold on to power, wanting to hold on to control, wanting to hold on to their narrative of the world will deliver their brother over to death, their children or their parents over to death, that when it comes down to the corrupting power of power, uh, we don't even prioritize our familial relationship relationships. So then let's look at 14 to 18. But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand. Interesting parenthetical phrase for a gospel that first was oral and then only later written down. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down, nor enter his house to take anything out. Let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. Alas, for women are pregnant, um, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it might not happen in winter. All right, so again, we have this sense of foreboding that's coming from Jesus, but this is not language that's unfamiliar to us. Think about this. We have heard several times in the Old Testament scriptures, in the Hebrew scriptures, of times when God has said, leave and don't turn back. That is the word that, that is given to the Hebrew slaves when they're being delivered from slavery in Egypt uh, across the Red Sea. Don't remember the instructions for Passover. They're supposed to eat standing up with their coats already on. Don't let the, don't 
take time to let the bread rise, get ready to go. We also saw that when Lot was being delivered from the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah and the instructions that he received not to turn back and look. And what would happen? Well, they'd be destroyed if they turn back and look. And of course, we know that Lot's wife did turn around um, and look. And that idea of turning around and looking, it's that idea of wanting to hold on to something that leads us to destruction. And when we decide to let go of the thing that can destroy us, when we decide to release the thing that, that is has enslaved us or crippled us or in some way entangled us, when we decide to leave that, we have to leave it all together. Probably the most um, obvious or commonly known of that are those who are battling alcoholism, who know that if they're going to overcome this the power that alcohol has on them, they have to let go of it entirely. There's no one drink for an alcoholic. And and so the instructions are to, to let it go entirely and never have a drink again. Similarly, when we decide to follow Jesus, when we decide that there's no power more important than the power of God's love in our lives, then there's really nothing else that we can hold on to. Now, y'all know that I love my t-shirt that says, I love Jesus, but I cuss a little. Uh, (laughs) And you also know that we've preached uh, for the last five weeks on the book of Galatians that talks about our freedom from the law. But If when we find ourselves wanting to follow Jesus, we also find ourselves wanting to hold on to old ways of living, we're going to have to come to a place where we confront that reality and say, I've got to let it go. I've got to let go of that sense of control over my life. I've got to let go of that um, proper way of doing things if that proper way of doing things is not a way of love. Um, I've got to let go of my expectations of everybody else and just focus on what God is calling me to. So when we're looking at these instructions that Jesus is giving, he's warning them that the resistance is going to come from those who want to hold on to their power. And they will go to any end to do that. And one of the things that we'll see, this abomination of desolation, it's an Old Testament reference to sacrificing a pig on the altar of the Lord, because it's like taking the most unclean thing and and offering that unclean thing in sacrifice. That's the way to sort of destroy um, that the meaning of it. So let's look at it a little bit more closely. Daniel 11 verses 31 and 32. Forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress and shall take away the regular burnt offering and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. You can also read more about it in Daniel 9, 27 and Daniel 12, 11, but I'm not going to take the time to do that myself. Now, the reference is to Antiochus the fourth, Antiochus Epiphanes the fourth. But what's happening here, I don't know if you all remember this. We actually had a reference to it a couple of weeks ago um, when we were reading in the Gospel of Mark. And it's a it's this Old Testament reference to the Babylonian exile. And when the Babylonians came to destroy Jerusalem and to destroy the temple for the first time, um, before they actually knocked it down, they, they, it's kind of, it's kind of the horrible things that are done in war that are done for the purpose of, of desecrating 
the things that are considered sacred. So when war happens, it is common in every war throughout history for soldiers to rape the women of the villages that they are, are um, taking over. We're still seeing it in places across the globe where there are conflicts. Um, this is the equivalent of, of raping the women. The, this desolation in the temple um, is, is to make something that is pure profane, to make something that is um, holy um, to be defiled. And it's, it's this intentional, it's like peeing on things as well. I mean, it's just like, what, what could we do to make this, this thing that is beautiful and pure and holy disgusting? And it's part of what humanity has done for centuries um, when, when we are um, attacking one another. Well, um, Eusebius in his church history tells us that the people of the church in Jerusalem were commanded by an oracle given by revelation before the war to those in the city who were worthy of it to depart and dwell in one of the cities of Perea, which they called Pella. To it, those who believed on Christ traveled from Jerusalem so that when holy men had altogether deserted the royal capital of the Jews and the whole land of Judea, um, there was a gathering then of Christians. So this is referencing in 70 AD um, when the temple was destroyed. You know, we always consider that destruction of the temple in 70 AD to be um, the mark of the last diaspora of Judaism. So it's the last time until 1948. It's the last time that the Jews gathered together in Jerusalem and called it their holy city. Um, but what we forget is that when the Romans got sick of the way that <clears throat> their occupying forces were being treated primarily by the Jews, and they decided to really clamp down and no longer allow there to be any Jewish ruling party in the city of Jerusalem, they also ended up dispersing the Christians. And, um, and, and so the sign was, you know, it's going to be bad as Christians when the temple of the Jews is destroyed. Because as much conflict as there was between the Jews and the Christians after Jesus's resurrection, um, there was still a greater conflict with the Romans. So if the Romans attack the Jews, then the Christians have no safety net whatsoever. And so there was this plan for them to escape Jerusalem. You can see Jerusalem uh, by my right ear and uh, go up to <laughs> Pella just above it. Um, notice where the Sea of Galilee is. It's basically halfway between Jerusalem and the Sea of Galilee. So moving back to the text, Mark 13, 14 to 18, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who's on the housetop not go down nor enter his house so um, I'm just showing you that Eusebius marks um, what Jesus suggested here in, in 14, that sort of going up into a place of escape so that they could um, regroup. All right, so 19 to 23, for in those days, there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of the creation that God created until now, and never will there be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect, whom God shows, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, don't believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard. 
I have told you all things beforehand. Listen, my friends, it is so easy for us to go down the rabbit hole of end times with this passage. It is so easy for us to be led into conversations about rapture and about um, dispensations. Um, but I'm going to say, let's not do that. Uh, and I'm going to say that for a couple of reasons. Number one, the word rapture is not in scripture. Number two, Jesus makes it very clear, and it is clearly recorded by more than one of the gospel writers that no one knows when this is going to happen. Y'all, no one knows, not even the son, the S-O-N, knows when this is going to happen. So what value is there to our being sucked into conversations about when this is going to happen when the Messiah himself, Jesus Christ, doesn't know when it's going to happen. And I would argue that at the end of the day, if we knew when this was going to happen, I'm not sure that we would end up being as generous with the gospel as God would want us to be. And instead, I think we would be circling our wagons and making sure that our children and their children and our those whom we loved would um, would be somehow safe. There's no safety <laughs> except for in Jesus at the end at the end times. Um, so the, if there is a guiding message. If there's a central message from this passage, it's be on guard. And so then we get this parable. Well, first we get the tribulation. I'll come back to that if I have a minute. Let me look at the parable with you for a second. Um, where is it? But concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. Be on guard, keep awake, for you do not know when the time will come. It's like a man going on a journey. When he leaves his home and puts his servants in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to stay awake. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening or at midnight, when the rooster crows or in the morning, lest he suddenly come and find you asleep. And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. If, if we're going to have rich conversations around chapter 13, let it be around this command to stay awake. Let it be around Jesus's calling us not to get too comfortable, but to stay on guard. Now, why would we want to stay on guard is really the question that's at hand. And the the question of staying on guard goes back to this parable of who's, what we're called to do and who we're called to do it for. It's like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his servants in charge. We are the servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've been asked to be kingdom builders on to the foundation that was laid in Jesus Christ. And we have been called to stay awake in this work that God has called us to. And are we, are we awake? Are we attentive to this gospel message of the good news of Jesus? Or have we gotten complacent? to the call. Y'all, I think it's really interesting. Hold on. I just tried to end the meeting for all of us instead of stopping my screen share. That would have been interesting, wouldn't it? Um, Lisa, if you'll remove the spotlight um, so that I so that we can get back to gallery view so we can see one another for just a, a couple minutes here. I I want us to um think for a moment about some of the negative repercussions of this pandemic. I, I've noticed it 
and I'm sad to say that I'm still noticing it, um, even as we're becoming a little bit uh, more ready for this to be over. When the pandemic first occurred, Eric and I sat outside in our front yard in a way that we never have in the 15 years um, that we have lived uh, lived in our house. We we've sat in our um, we sat in our front yard and we watched people walk by. But here's the weird thing: people walked by and didn't look at us. They didn't speak to us. We had so much fear in the beginning of the pandemic that that it's like we were afraid that saying hello to somebody was going to somehow, you know, transmit the virus. So now we're in this habit and we're we think we're being courteous, right? We're walking down the sidewalk and somebody's coming towards us and either they or we will cross the street to walk on the sidewalk on the other side so as not to breathe on one another, right? but we're still not speaking to each other. Um, we've stopped shaking hands, which is a good thing. And frankly, I'd be okay if we don't go back to shaking hands. I hate shaking hands. I believe in the germ theory of disease. I don't wanna shake your hand because I know what you just did with it. So, <laughs> so um, I'm okay with you know weird things like, um, some of the ways that we interact, but I'm not okay with our getting to a place of um, of not being kind to to our neighbor, not speaking to our neighbor, not interacting. Now, this is not true for everybody, and I know that some of y'all been partying with your neighbors in your driveway since the pandemic began. So I get that it's not, but I saw a lot of heads nodding when I started mentioning that we we seem to stop making eye contact with each other. Um, it's easier just to sort of bow your head and walk past somebody in the grocery store than it is to try to figure out, you know, how, how far apart should we be standing? And is it okay if we're talking to each other, if we have our masks on and you can't hear me. So now I feel like I need to pull my mask down. You know, like it's awkward. We at the very least, we can all agree that it's awkward, right? Why am I talking about this? Well, I'm talking about this because um, here we are in the middle of something that any good rapturist or dispensationalist could look at and go, see, it's a sign of the end times. And have we gotten more excited about telling people about Jesus in this time of the pandemic? Or has fear taken over? Has, have we become, have we circled our wagons? Have we been concerned about caring for those who are just in our small sphere of influence? Or have we even allowed ourselves to be inspired to go, let's make sure that everybody knows about Jesus? Be on guard, stay awake, because we don't know when this time is going to come. So are we keeping good watch? Are we being good stewards of the church and of God's creation by sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, by loving our neighbors, by caring about people? Or in the midst of one of the things that someone could say, here is one of the signs of the end times, have we actually become like turtles and kind of gone inside our, our shells? We are being called to be, uh, to tend to the gifts that God has given us because we don't know. At the very least, we don't know if you're going to get hit by a bus tomorrow, you know? So, so what, uh, even if it's not the, the end destruction of the world, are we taking advantage of every opportunity that we have to give witness to why God is good, to bear witness to our salvation, to tell others the good news of Jesus? I would say, this is a weird chapter, and it fits in a category of weird chapters that we find in both Hebrew scripture and New Testament scripture, including the entire book of Revelation. And there are specific explanations for what each of those things might be, and there's also a mystery that shrouds the weird chapters of scripture. But I think that we're better off keeping Jesus's main thing, the main thing, which is stay awake. 
um, than we are to try and decipher with some kind of code what each of the um, words in in the chapter necessarily mean. And here's the, you know, not irony, but the important statement. It is three days before his arrest, three days before his disciples do what in the Garden of Gethsemane? Fall asleep. So let's not be among them. Let's stay awake. I'll close this in prayer and Lisa will shoot you into your small group rooms. Um, and those of you who are not normally here on Thursday mornings, we would love to put you in a small group to have some conversation around the questions that Mary Beth has written for us. Let me pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks that you have given us this time together. We give you thanks that we cannot accomplish your scripture, nor do we even understand it all, because that then brings us back to dependency on you. It brings us back to looking to you and your Holy Spirit to reveal to us your word. It brings us back out of curiosity time and time again to see things that we didn't see the last time we were here. So as we go into these small group conversations, we ask that you would continue to illuminate your word for us, that you would continue to speak to us, and that you would continue to show us the way in which you have called us to be your emissaries, your representatives, those who hold the love of Jesus and pour it out on others in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks so much for being here, you guys. I'll see you next week. As always, I'll be here. Feel free to grab me if you need me.